Oh, look at this. Hey, hey Rick. Good oh, to see you. Awesome. Thanks yeah. again for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Whoa, what do we got here? Yes, we got some gin in the house. Whoa. Right. I brought my botanicals. I brought a cocktail shaker. Um, yeah. All right. Fantastic. All right. So first and foremost, you're going to notice there's a connection to this weekend. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But tell us about the background and you starting Gin Lane. Yeah. So um, I launched Gin Lane in the U.S. about a year ago. Um, the whole positioning of the brand, and, the, and I'll get to the style of the pink gin, but my line, my range of gins is celebrating the historic roots of gin. So um, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of new gins that are, have been launching. There's a little bit of a gin renaissance going. Right. Some are walking away a bit from the traditional style, the, 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 the traditional structure of gin, which is obviously very juniper forward. Um, I love gin. I basically embellished uh, that style and launched Gin Lane 1751, which um, takes a very famous uh, painting called Gin Lane, which depicted gin as a epidemic that came into to London, England in the mid-1700s. Okay. And then 1751, which was the eighth and final gin act that kind of reformed the spirit today. So, nice. um, Now, I'm a, believe it or not, everybody knows I'm the wine enthusiast, and yes, I have not had a glass of wine today. I know it's very impressive. Um, I'm a gin and tonic drinker, so I'm, and it's mostly my summertime thing. So right. it's like I literally start drinking in May, and I probably taper off somewhere around October. But I would try to have these things in different concoctions that you can make with the gins, and I think I... I want to say I taste at least four, right? Is yeah, it, yeah. The, the tasting on London. Yeah, so I've got I've got a London Dry, which is the sort of most mainstream style, a uh, Tangeray Bombay Beefeater style. Right. So I've got two London Dries. One's at 80, uh, 80 proof. One's at ninety four. So the ninety four is a little bit more high octane, a little bit more of the concentrated botanical flavor. The pink gin. Um, and I have an Old Tom, and Old Tom is a sweeter style. So a little sugar's added. Higher note of the licorice bot botanical, star anise. Very smooth, very well balanced. So I'm getting a message right now from Jim Verity telling that he really loves the pink gin. And Jim, you're going to have a chance to taste on Saturday night because I know you have no choice but to be there because you're designing the, one of the events. So don't worry. Oh, make right. sure, we'll make sure you get to taste it there on Saturday. <laughs> so this is how it kind of came to be with us talking about the participation in it. And MS Walker, who's your local distributor yes. here in Rhode Island, um, reached out to me and said, you know, we've got this great guy. He's very involved in getting involved in the community. He's got a great product. And like I said, I had the opportunity to taste them at the tasting that took place on Monday. Um, this pink gin obviously fits the theme of going into the Gloria Gemma Flames of Hope this weekend. So the caterers that are there, which we have, it's Milanzi Fine Catering, it's doing the concessions, has taken a, a decent quantity of this order, and they're going to be making special cocktails with it throughout the weekend. So specialty cocktails at each of those bars, and then even into the VIP tent, um, for the pink party, they're going to be doing the same thing. So this will be, along with a couple of your other gins, yep. this will be the featured gin this weekend. Now, and the style of this gin, so this gin is pink, it's not watermelon, it's not hibiscus infused, this literally has Angostura bitters added to a London dry style gin. So it still tastes very much like gin, it'll have the, the structure, the characteristics that, that gin lovers like, a slight note of Angostura bitter. So this little herbal spicy note. So that's what I was just going to ask you. It's herbal. It's herbal, yes. So, yep, yep. so Angostura and pink gin was very, very popular in the 1800s in, uh, in England. It supposedly was invented by the British Royal Navy to help quell seasickness, which if you're in the Navy, you should not be getting seasick. <laughs> so I think that that was their way of balancing out sweet and dry gin. So, so I, I got to tell you, I don't know, and you're mentioning these herbals and stuff, I don't know enough, and I've I got to imagine a lot of us don't know enough about the herbs and the things that go into it. So what did you bring here to kind of help us describe and understand this? Yeah, so these are the eight um, botanicals that we use in the gin. So these are, and these eight botanicals that we use... Um, Cassia bark, which is a, a, a style of cinnamon. Okay. Um, yeah. It's a style of cinnamon? Style of cinnamon, yeah. So if you crack that is open. That okay? Yeah, oh yeah. Crack it open, you can smell it. Um, oh my God, that's awesome. Yeah. So it adds a beautiful sort of spicy note to the gin. But it's bark, um, Cassia bark. But it's bark, yeah. Okay. Um, juniper, obviously, which is, uh, you know, what the predominant flavor uh, in, in all gins uh, are and should be. It smells like gin when you open it. it smells yeah. like the gin. Yep, and that's a, just, a, just a berry that grows on a tree. It's dried out. Um, I've got uh, oranges from Seville. I've got lemons from Sicily. Um, orris root, which is a very uh, earthy, uh, slight floral uh, flavor. It's the strongest kind of polymer in the, in the gin that kind of makes all the other botanicals stick to it. 
uh, coriander, angelica, and then star anise. So those, th these botanicals are historically the eight traditional botanicals that were used when the English invented gin. So where are you producing these gins? So these are made in London, England. So these are made at Thames Distillers. I partnered with the, uh, the eighth generation gin distiller, Charles Maxwell. His, he has gin flowing through his veins. His, his family and lineage dates back to the late 1600s of making gin. So when I came to him with my idea, which was, I want historic, traditional, Victorian-esque gins, um, he loved it because it was something that he loves traditional style of gin. So this is, I mean, but the company you based it here. Yeah. So yeah. So I have a I have a, a, a partner, uh, Carl Stevenson, who yeah. who lives in London, England. He kind of runs the business over there, and I'm I'm U.S. based uh, that and run the business here. So where can we find your product? Obviously, Rhode Island. Yeah. I know they've got it in Rhode Island, but it is available throughout New England yet, or how yeah. It's, it's so it's throughout New England. I'm in Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, all the way nice. down to Maryland. Yeah. So. Retailers, um, restaurants, um, great price point on this. This in a liquor store would be a, a twenty-seven, twenty-eight, ninety-nine um, so retail very, price. So incredibly reasonable. Yeah, for small batch, as legitimate as you can get, made in the city of the country that so created the fine. Spirit. Have you found that with producing like the pink gin and these other ones that you have, have mm -hmm. you found that it's more of getting people? I mean, obviously you just educated us here on this, but. Do you find that you're educating people more and they're enjoying gin more now because of this? Yeah, I think that gin has a bit of a stigma. And the stigma uh, resides in a certain age demographic that consumes gin. My grandparents drank gin, so when I was growing up, gin was, for older people, very stigmatizing. Heavy, big pine flavor, which is the juniper uh, flavor. Um, but I think because of classic cocktails having a resurgence, yeah. um, I think people getting a little bit tired of a uh, odorless, colorless, tasteless vodka. Agreed. You know, gin is essentially vodka flavored with botanicals. So instead of a vodka, most vodkas have a very sugary apple, exactly. blue raspberry. <clears throat> um, think of gin as a flavored vodka, but with botanicals that give a bit more of uh, earth tones and spices to it. So one of the things that I was learning on Monday when I went to the tasting, and you had, I'm going to mess up his name and I apologize, but the gentleman that was assisting you and he also does some work over... Yes, Corey Hayes. Corey, yeah. so yeah. Corey was like almost like a mixologist, if you will. Sure. Is what he was telling me about is that the number of cocktails, and this is where it goes into the education, exactly what you just said about the vodka side of things is that this is almost, and I, it's just kind of maybe a silly word from my perspective, but almost healthier because it's not all that sugar right. that's coming in with the vodkas, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. And the number of things, that, I mean, he was saying there's things that he's almost using this to substitute right. for some of those vodkas. Oh, yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think that that opens up a new opportunity, and if you are into this in the mixology and these great bars that are out there that, I mean, their cocktail lists are as big as their wine lists, there's really a new opportunity for you to come and try these things out and participate with them. And that's one of the things I'm looking forward to is participation this weekend. I think it's going to be a great introduction to get people to learn that, especially coming up with the Flames Folk signature cocktail that Milazzi's Fine Catering is going to do. Now, when Jeff and I spoke and got him involved, he was incredibly generous and already made an offer that he's doing for the foundation. And I want to just kind of talk about that and let you say what you're already doing for the foundation? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm donating some money on behalf of my company, uh, $1,000 to the charity this year. Um, we, we're going to have a variety of restaurants um, and bars in, in Rhode Island uh, with a concentration on Providence featuring the Pink Gin all throughout the month of October. There'll be, uh, it'll probably still be a regular price, but what they're going to do is they're going to donate a pretty hefty portion of that cocktail sale back to the Gloria Gemma Foundation. Um, I personally uh, have been affected by breast cancer. Uh, my, my cousin um, currently has it right now. Uh, my mom passed away from cancer. She had cancer throughout her whole body. So, um, you know, the big C, as some people call it, is, is one of those things that it's horrible. It's, 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 it's unbelievable how many people are affected by it. So yeah, that's, um, that's a very good point is that it's, you know, like I said, everybody today had a personal touch to this. And I think that no matter who you know, you know someone or someone that's related to you that has gone through this in one shape or form or another. And the support group of being a part of this is tremendous. Your donation, I know the foundation is extremely appreciative of that because it helps go a long way for these causes that they do to educate people and then support those that have our survivors are recovering. So to have you make that contribution to them before the festival's even occurred is fantastic. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. That. It's great to be a um, part of it. And what's going to happen in the month of October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, is that, like you said, is that there's going to be a lot of restaurants that are featuring this. So you can expect to see it on social media.
I've been following now Jen Lane's pages, so you're on everything. You're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Twitter, the whole thing. Right. So you can get some of those cocktail ideas and things that are out there, but also I gotta imagine over the next week or so you'll be able to start finding the places that are serving this that you can go support to help give back for all these causes that are there. Um, this is, I mean, when did you find the company? I launched this brand uh, about a year ago. Okay. Yeah, a year ago in the States, a year before that in the UK. So, really new. I mean, oh, yes, yeah, we're really, new. Really, really new yep. to the market. Yeah. Do you have plans to kind of expand the lines or do other products? Yeah, you know, with me staying true to the historical, uh, you know, original style of gin, yeah. um, but my partner and I have spoken about maybe some seasonality, some seasonal different kind of releases that we plan to do. So um, if someone goes to the UK for a trip where this is being produced, do they offer tours, tastings there as well? They, the, the distillery right now does <clears> not <throat> suit. Eventually they will. Um, but my partner and I are putting together kind of a, a historic gin sort of a walking tour in the city of London so that you can not only obviously taste Gin Lane 1751, but you can really kind of get a great idea of these certain pivotal areas geographically within the city of London and, and that's really interesting because from the historical perspective, we talk about this a lot on the show with wine, as we talk about the history of wine. He's mentioned three or four times today, just throughout the interview, of, of the history of this and where it's come from and where it's evolved to now. Right. So to be able to have that and go to that, I think that's a nice tourism mechanism where people would really enjoy that. So which is your favorite gin and what's your favorite cocktail that you're making with a gin? Yeah, so um, I love the pink gin. Unique, different. Again, like I said, it, will, it still tastes very much like gin. It just has this very nice herbal spicy note on the back end from the bitters. Um, I go very simple with the pink gin. I go tonic or club soda and a wedge of lime. Really? And the bitters come out, uh, the club soda and the fizz or the tonic just give it a little bit of dilution so it's not you know, pure gin. Um, but a Negroni, which typically calls for you know one part gin, one part Campari, one part uh, sweet vermouth. Um, the pink gin goes great with it because Campari, which is very bitter, uh, complement the, the bitters that are in the pink gin. So if this weekend on Saturday you see me wandering around and I'm drinking gin and not wine yet, you'll understand that I'm relaxing and enjoying the day because that's I, I'm a gin tonic. That's really what it is. So right. I put lime in there, the tonic, and that's, that's it. it. But when I tried this the other night, that's the first thing I thought about is that can I have that kind of drink and it still be as refreshing and enjoy it? And, I think the answer is absolutely yes. So Jeff has produced a great product. Thankful to his partner that's done this. Thankful for their contributions and coming up for this weekend. Um, these are one of the things is that it's important for us to educate and bring you knowledge as to how this fits into the taste of everything that you're doing. Culinary, dining, mixology, wines. And this weekend, their support of a local organization is even more important. To have that donation, as we mentioned, I'm not going to stop highlighting that because it's a big deal. So, Jeff, thanks for making the time. Thanks great for coming in, educators. Really, really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, great to be part of it. Thanks, thanks for having so me on. Much. Let's all make gin great again. <laughs> <as they laughs>